Senator Thorpe has submitted a proposal understanding Order 75 today. It is shown as item 12 on today's order of business. It is, proposed, is the proposal supported? There's, there's only one person. Four people. Come there on, is, Babbitt. There help is me not out. four help people me standing. With, with, the, with the concurrence of the Senate, the clerks will set the clock in line with the informal arrangements made by the whips. I call Senator Thorpe. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. First Nations deaths in custody are a national crisis. In 1991, we had a Royal Commission into Aboriginal deaths in custody, yet here we are 32 years later, more than a generation later, and more and more of our people are dying in custody instead of putting an end to this crisis. When I first walked into this chamber, I carried this message stick engraved with one life for each death Senator, in custody since the Royal Commission, Senator, which was supposed Senator to put an Thorpe, end. Senator Thorpe, you know very well that we don't allow props to be used in the chamber. I was allowed so to I'd bring it in when I walked in to this That was when you in. walked in. 441 you... deaths in custody Senator when I Thorpe, into this place. I ask you to be seated. Now we've got Senator Thorpe, are you going to continue? Proper way, yes. Yes, can I continue? You can continue. That stick, when I walked in here, had 441 deaths in custody. Now we have over 540 deaths in custody. At least back in 91, this got public attention. But not now. Nobody wants to know about it. Even though Labor's own father of reconciliation, Senator Dodson, has called the government out about its inaction. In the last three decades, we have seen government after government letting us down clearly showing that they don't care. You didn't care, now you don't care. Each and every one of those lives matter to us and to many people. Some of these people whose lives you're throwing away were not even sentenced or held for even minor offences as was the case with Tanya Day, being arrested because she put her feet on the train seat. She died because she put her feet on the train seat. A white fella wouldn't be arrested for that. Labor and the coalition are in the race to the bottom, to the bottom to be tough on crime. However, we all know that the social factors are the first and foremost determining crime rates. Most of the recommendations of the Royal Commission were on social factors to make sure that our people are not being left behind. Every government comes up with new buzzwords on how they are going to deal with black people in this country, closing the gap, introducing advisory body after advisory body. Yet there's no changes on the ground. More of our people are being incarcerated, more people dying in custody, and more of our people are taking their lives. I talked to black fellas in prisons and they told me about the hanging points. They told me exactly where the hanging points are in the prison cell. The recommendation talks about the hanging points in these cells and these young men are telling me where they are and how they'll tell each other how to hang themselves. You can't blame them. What does their future look like in this country? The system knows about these hanging points. 
but nothing's being done. Not a problem if another one of us dies. Worst of all are the privately operated prisons, those operating the criminal circo, which the government love having on board and paying them. But circo are the real criminals here. They are the ones hurting and killing our people. All this is allowed because there is still wide-ranging systemic racism in this country, in all institutions, first and foremost the police, the police violence and against First Nations people is off the chart in this country. All your voices to parliament, all your closing the gap gammon statements, all worth nothing because you ain't saving our people's lives in this country. So do it. Get the 339 right recommendations from the Royal Commission that this country paid for. Implement them now, because black lives matter in this country. Stop killing us. Senator, your time has expired. Senator Little. Thank you. The last project I worked directly on before being elected to the Senate was to put in place a custody notification service in South Australia for the Aboriginal Legal Rights Movement, ALRM. The custody notification service, CNS, provides round-the-clock support to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people taken into custody by police. The service required notifying ALRM as soon as practicable on arrest that they have an Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander person in custody. The benefits were for assisting police to discharge their duty of care and reducing risk for everyone. The service facilitated communication between the arrested person and ALRM, who provided a holistic wellbeing check and basic legal advice and communication with police for those who were held with or without charge. It was a simple step in reducing preventable deaths in custody and related harm. One of the saddest stories I've heard was when in the NT a few years ago a woman was taken into custody after police responded to a domestic and family violence report. A baby left behind died. The CNS assists disclosure of issues related to medication and or mental health issues or personal issues that might create risk for a person held in custody and or others. It was funded by the coalition while in government and the NIAA website advises that an evaluation to determine the effectiveness of CNS uh, and is underway to identify the gaps and opportunities for improvement. It has been that way since September 2022, and I very much look forward to finding out what the future of CNS is. I want to talk about the fastest growing cohort of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people in custody. It's women. Although Indigenous Australians make up 3.2 per cent of the general population, they make up around 32 per cent of all prisoners. The Australian Law Reform Commission suggests the rate at which Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women are imprisoned is a reflection on the multiple and layered nature of disadvantage they face. That is, the links between entrenched disadvantage, including social, cultural and economic forms, and increased rates of criminal justice contact. These are well established. These must also be tackled too. It is the reason I argue so strongly for improving expectations, performance and accountability of service provision everywhere, because improving these outcomes will provide the foundations for people to build their own lives and their own futures. Where these fail to deliver as they should, the people who rely on them struggle. The Law Reform Commission provides evidence that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women are frequent victims of crime, particularly interpersonal or violent crime. Female Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander prisoners are likely to have been victims of crimes themselves, particularly family violence and sexual abuse. When I was in Alice Springs recently, I went to visit a, the um, Alternative to Custody Life Skills Camp, run by the Drug and Alcohol Services Australia organisation. There I met a number of women, young women, mothers, women who, while behind a high fence and with ankle bracelets, generously and confidently shared their stories and hopes and desires for building a better, a different future on release. They explained how their decision to participate 
in the Alternative to Custody program enable them to live in a 10-unit complex learning cooking skills, literacy and numeracy and getting relevant support from counsellors. It's a six-month program, a community model to address behaviour and it recognises cultural and individual needs and values. Women can self-refer or they can come directly from custody. The women shared their greatest fear on leaving custody was finding housing that would support them to maintain a stable home from which to anchor and rebuild their lives and the lives of their families. They were also concerned about remaining safe and free from the scourge of domestic and family violence. While addressing deaths in custody is important, it is also equally focused, important to focus on prevention, and that means children going to school, the expectations of parents to send those children to school, teachers who are focused on high expectations for those children because they turn up to learn, an opportunity for a ward and training and a job when they finish learning to ensure they are on a much more positive life trajectory. It's quite simply not complex and it's not too much to ask us. Thank you, Senator. Senator Dotson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Acting President. Uh, any death in custody should concern us all. And it's clear that the number of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples dying in custody is a sad matter for families and reminds governments things need to change. I was a commissioner of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody, which reported more than 30 years ago. More than 500 Aboriginal people have died in custody since that time, and that is a statistic that I know unsettles us all. But as the Royal Commission found after its exhaustive four years of inquiry, it's not the death rates of Aboriginal people are higher than non-Aboriginal people in custody. It's the rate at which they are taken into custody that leaves Aboriginal people so grossly not only represented in our prison populations, but vulnerable to death in custody. The root, what's the root cause of this dreadful statistic? It's simply too many Aboriginal people are being locked up. Imprisonment should be the measure of last resort, as the Royal Commission said. The Productivity Commission reported last year that First Nations peoples are 13.5 times more likely to be in prison than non-Indigenous Australians. First Nations people make up only 3.8 per cent of the Australian population, but they represent 32 per cent of the adult prison population. These figures are completely unacceptable. There have been dreadful examples of neglect and abuse in our state and territory criminal justice systems, in lock-ups and prisons and custody more generally. And it's long been my position that those who have responsibility for care and supervision of people in custody must be held to account. I was particularly disturbed by the findings earlier this year by the Victorian coroner who inquired into the horrific death of the lady who died in spite of having sought help from custodial officers more than 30 times. I do note that the coroner found that if all the recommendations of the Royal Commission had been implemented, her death would likely have been avoided. But I reject the premise of this matter of public importance, public interest, that the government of which I am a part of is unwilling to take action. We are serious about reducing the number of First Nations peoples going to jails, that's why in October's budget last year, we committed $99 million to fund First Nations justice package. And that, of that money, $81.5 million will be invested in up to 30 community-led justice reinvestment programs across the country. We've already identified two priority sites uh, for early intervention in Alice Springs and Halls Creek. We want to build a successful and build on the success of initiatives like those people at Burke in New South Wales. There the Aboriginal community has worked with governments, service providers and with great success to support local initiatives. That's what's going to, ha that's what's going to have to happen across the country. If 
We are going to meet the justice targets under the national agreement on closing the gap for both adults and youth. Of course, this is not the only approach required if we are to make progress. Our federal system, many of the levers of change sit with the states and territories. They are the ones with control of police, prisons and health care that is provided within them. But national leadership is critical. The previous government was intent on abdicating responsibility back to the states and territories. This government will not shirk from its duties. This government has reinstated the Standing Council of Attorney Generals and made Indigenous justice a standing agenda item. It's working with states and territories to develop a proposal to raise the minimum age for criminal responsibility. It's funding for the first time legal representation for families at coronial inquest and it's advancing real-time reporting of deaths in custody to ensure better accountability across the country. We need to keep First Nations peoples out of jails and out of lock-ups. That's our goal and we're determined to achieve it. Thank you, Senator. Senator Cox. Thank you, Acting Deputy President. I rise to speak to this motion on behalf of the Australian Greens. As a First Nations woman, I know all too well about the unacceptable rates of deaths in custody in Australia's history and also at present. Particularly being from Western Australia, which has the highest number of First Nations deaths in custody, I want to acknowledge the family and the descendants of the town of Roeburn in Western Australia, my home state, which was the catalyst for the Royal Commission after the death of John Pat. We don't know exactly how many First Nations people have died in custody since the 1991 Royal Commission because it just keeps happening, but more than 520 First Nations people have died in custody, and that is what we do know in the last 30 years. I want to take a moment to acknowledge those 520 families and communities that have lost loved ones from which have been taken from them all too soon. My heartfelt thoughts are always with them as we continue to do this work, which in itself is unnecessary and cruel lack of action results in their loss. Unfortunately, this is not a new issue either. I mentioned earlier the, 99, uh, the 1991 Royal Commission into Deaths in Custody, which has produced a list of 339 recommendations, at which 36 per cent of those have not been fully implemented. So we've got a report. What are we going to need to do now? And why aren't we doing this? It's absolutely shameful. And the Greens have continuously called for Medicare in prisons. And coroners have stated this could actually help to reduce deaths in custody. And our deaths while in custody are from health conditions which are in fact treatable, meaning that many deaths are entirely preventable if there is adequate community controlled and culturally appropriate health care available in custody. Identifying these presenting health issues and maintaining people's health whilst they're in prison is vitally important in playing a key role in preventing deaths in custody. I want to finish by speaking about my time as a police officer in the West Australian Police Force. During this time, I was responsible for transporting, caring for and processing people in custody. The continuum in this care is important to contextualise and understand the fundamental human right frameworks that are based on the human rights, uh, UN human rights principles for people in custody. And these include all prisoners shall be treated with respect due to their inherent dignity, dignity and values as a human being. There shall be no discrimination on the grounds of race, colour, sex, language, religion, political or other opinion, national or social origin, property, birth or either status. This, an example of this is the requirement for police officers to conduct cell checks every 20 minutes unless they get an alarm raised for whatever issue that may be presenting. And a clear example of that is the case of Miss Jew. Everyone has the right to be treated with humanity, dignity and respect, and this includes people who are in custody regardless of time, Order. place and circumstance. But unfortunately Your this is not the case expired. for First Nations people. Senator Green. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, Acting President, I just rise to speak briefly on this um, uh, matter of public importance. I um, thank the uh, speakers who have contributed to this debate, and particularly can I acknowledge um, my colleague, Senator Dodson. Um, he 
um, has asked me to speak on this important motion and I do so acknowledging his long-standing um, work in Aboriginal affairs, particularly as director of the Central and Kimberley Land Councils and, of course, in, in relation to this important um, matter in, as Commissioner of the Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody. Um, it's clear that um, there has been um, little to no um, change in some of the facts and figures that have been cited by those um, uh, in this debate, and that is a case of national shame and a case of national tragedy. Um, but we certainly um, are not on this side of the chamber um, uh, sitting on our hands or ignoring um, Senator Dodson in his calls for action or um, ignoring those in the community who want to see change. Um, First Nations deaths in custody are a national shame and a major marker of the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians. They cause devastating and intergenerational trauma for families and communities. Um, I'm, uh, I live in far north Queensland, in north Queensland, and <clears throat> it's fair to say that, the, um, that deaths in custody in our region have um, formed part of the identity of communities um, and, of course, the tragedy of communities as well. And I speak without naming the person um, about the death in custody in 2004 on Palm Island, which has um, caused so much heartache um, and despair in that community. Um, our government is listening to communities about taking steps, um, something that the previous government failed to do. The government is absolutely committed, absolutely committed to addressing the ongoing tragedy of First Nations deaths in custody, and it is uh, completely, completely um, uncalled for and inappropriate for those opposite or, or anyone in this chamber, chamber to um, uh, insinuate that this government is ignoring these recommendations or even the Royal Commission itself. As the Royal Commission has made clear, there are many reasons um, that Indigenous deaths in custody occur, but of course the main reason is that the, um, the rates of uh, incarceration in the Indigenous community are so high. Too many young Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people are, in particular are being robbed of their futures by a system that has completely let them down. First Nations people are 13 times more likely to be imprisoned, making up to 30 per cent of the adult prison population, but only 2 per cent of the Australian population. And certainly we know that um, uh, young Indigenous people make up a, um, a major um, proportion of juvenile, people in juvenile detention. So, um, our, our government is taking steps. That's why we've invested $81.5 million in 30 community-led justice reinvestment initiatives across Australia. And we're establishing an independent national justice reinvest reinvestment unit. Uh, this was a recommendation from the Australian Law Reform Commission, and we are putting it in place. This is the largest funding package in justice reinvestment ever committed by the Commonwealth. Justice reinvestment will involve a community-led and holistic approach to keeping at-risk individuals out of the criminal justice system in the first place. It's such an important step to be taken. Justice reinvestment is something that the former government failed to do, and we are righting that wrong by investing in this important, important strategy for First Nations people. Uh, these projects will address the underlying socio-economic drivers that increase First Nations people's risk of contact with the criminal justice system by working with local communities on local solutions. And that really is key, can I say, to achieving any type of reform or change uh, in this area of policy or um, in this uh, space, is, is working with local communities. Um, we need to listen to what the solutions are on the ground and we need to implement those solutions. That's why existing justice reinvestments programs have proven record, re record reduced incarceration, reduced crime and reduced recidivism. It's incredibly important that these programs are supported and we Order. seek that support from those across the chamber. Time has expired. Senator Roberts. Thank you. If we want real solutions to our country's problems, we must deal with facts. With deaths in custody, the data shows there's no crisis. The rate of deaths in custody has been steady for 20 years, at around half its early 90s peak. 
These are indisputable data from the Australian Institute of Criminology, the government agency tasked especially with monitoring deaths in custody. Adjusted for population, non-Indigenous prisoners were twice as likely to die in prison than Indigenous. Yes, you heard that right. If you are not an Indigenous person, you are twice as likely to die in prison than an Indigenous prisoner. Due to the small numbers, deaths in police custody fluctuate from year to year. The data on Indigenous deaths in police custody per Indigenous population has drastically reduced since the 90s and has remained steady at this low rate for nearly 20 years. The real crisis is of male deaths in prison. On a population-adjusted basis in the last reported year, men were 60 per cent more likely to die in prison than women. Senator Shoebridge. The sickening regularity of deaths of First Nations people in custody is a cause for national shame. It's indeed a cause for international condemnation of our country and our government and this place. More than 540 First Nations peoples have died in custody since 1991. This is not an accident. First Nations deaths in custody are the product of a racist criminal justice system which over-polices First Nations communities, of systematic disadvantage, of courts that are more likely to send First Nations people to prison and of prisons that are unsafe in structural and systemic ways. And these, as Senator Cox made clear, are all the result of political decisions from parties in this place who won't stand up when powerful police associations demand more powers and more resources, from those who are more interested in funding new prisons and new cells than programs to support communities or even listening to communities in the first place. The Royal Commission into Aboriginal Deaths in Custody was announced in 1987, more than 35 years ago. And in response, it was in response to the shocking and awful deaths of First Nations peoples, including 16-year-old John Pat from WA, who died in a police cell in 1983. John Pat was brutally murdered by police, who beat him to death outside a police station, and no one has ever been found guilty for his murder. In fact, in the 234 years since the invasion of this land, not a single prison officer has been convicted for a black death in custody. This is why the common chant at First Nations rallies rings across this country, and it rings so true. They say accident, we say murder. The Royal Commission made, re made crucial recommendations to make prisons less dangerous, an obvious one being the removal of hanging points in cells. A simple matter, you think, to undertake when we're seeing billions and billions of dollars spent on new and expanded prisons. But 32 years later, there are thousands and thousands of prison cells in this country that still contain hanging points where desperate people can and do hang themselves. And so when we're told by the former government or by this government that it's fixed, that the recommendations have been implemented, it's a downright lie and it's a lie that is killing First Nations peoples. The lack of proper medical care in prisons is also a deadly assault. It's a deadly and it's a and, and it's it's a deadly assault on First yeah. Nations on First Nations inmates. Our supposedly yeah. universal health care system literally stops at the doors of a prison and those and often therefore fails to meet those who, who most urgently need the help. Like Douglas Shillingsworth who died in a New South Wales prison following an ear infection. Mutija means the strong one, which was, which was uh, his name in Murrawari language. He was killed by an ear infection because of inadequate care. We need to urgently put Medicare into prisons, and we need that Medicare delivered by Aboriginal-controlled health organisations so it delivers the culturally Order. safe care Your that First Nations peoples expired. need.